told you it was going to happen. I knew it was going to happen. Here's my false start. Okay. Welcome back to week five of our advertising school. This week, we're talking about art direction. We have Maria Lee queued up to share some knowledge with us. She is an associate art director at Goodby. Uh, she's worked at 72 and Sunny. She's worked at Google. She's worked at a bunch of, of shops you, you've known and whose work you've loved. Uh, I think she's got some really interesting and unique experience that uh, will hopefully help us kind of understand art direction, not just from the agency perspective, but in terms of kind of overall responsibilities, what it's like to be on the client side. So um, start thinking about your questions. Um, quick announcement before we get into it. Just a reminder that next week class is on Tuesday instead of Monday, uh, given that it's like the 4th of July weekend, um, we wanted to kind of break up and, and not be right butted up against the, the holiday. Um, so we will be on Tuesday next week, uh, July 7th. Um, we're also going to distribute a survey to you guys. Uh, obviously, like this is our, our kind of first time trying to host anything close to kind of an online learning series like this. So we would love some insight from you guys in terms of what's been interesting so far, what's not been interesting so far, um, where, we're, where we're missing, where we're hitting. Um, any, any of that kind of feedback is super helpful because you guys probably have a lot more experience uh, kind of going through online classes right now than, than any of us on the, our advertising school team have. Um, we also have, so Dan Greener, uh, Edward King, and Neha Guria, from the, our advertising school team on today. Uh, they're gonna be in the chat helping answer questions. As usual, if you have questions, comments, feel free to raise your hand. Um, as questions come up, like feel free to, to drop simple ones into the chat. Uh, where it makes sense, I'll, I'll unmute people as usual uh, and let Maria answer and share her knowledge with you as, as we have questions. We'll have a dedicated Q&A session at the end. Um, I think, with all that said, uh, Maria, we would love to learn about art direction from you. All right, let's do it. Um, hi guys, my name is Maria and it is so nice to meet you all. Um, thank you, Joe, Dan, Neha and Edward for having me here and um, yeah, let's get into it. Just gonna quickly share my screen. Can you guys uh, see my screen? Yes. Cool. Going to present mode. All right, well, we're here. Um, week five, I think you said, um, to talk about art direction. Um, I think just quickly before we go into um, the lesson, just wanna you know, kind of talk about my experience a little bit. Um, definitely want this to be conversational. So if you guys have any questions, just you know, raise your hand and, and let me know. Feel free to stop me at any point. Um, I am a, uh, an associate creative director at Goodby Silverstein and Partners. And I put a photo of myself and my dog in here because I always feel a little awkward um, if I'm just kind of the only person in the photo and sharing it live for some reason. So this makes me feel a little bit more comfortable. Um, so yeah, just a little bit of, about my background. So um, it's actually in design. Um, I was trained as a graphic designer and I went to Rhode Island School of Design where I made zero ads. Um, in fact, when I was there at the time, I was, uh, a lot of my professors were these kind of old school, traditional um, graphic designers that were, uh, that came from Europe. So they were very much in, in, in the um, sort of this like Bauhaus and like um, Swiss avant-garde, that kind of clean sort of style. And they believed that design was much more superior to advertising because design is pure and ad basically lie. Um, ads will make up lies to kind of get you to like buy your product or believe in your brand. Um, so I kind of, you know, I was a little bit, um, I think to this day, I can't really explain how I ended up in this business, but um, I think I fell in love in, with like the storytelling aspect of advertising. Um, and here I am, I could be Silverstein and Partners making lots of ads. And to me, so kind of, you know, combining my experience in design with art direction um, and in between um, 
through my agency jobs, I also spent uh, some time on the brand side at Google. I'm learning a lot about AI, machine learning, um, AR, VR. And um, so for me, there's like, there's a really interesting intersection between design, art direction, and technology. Um, so for me personally, design is all about solving problems, whereas the art direction is all about telling visual stories. And technology is the thing that provides tools so you can connect with your audience and effectively communicate your idea. And a lot of, you know, some of the most talented art directors that I've met um, in my career really excel at all three of these. And I want you guys to kind of keep these things in mind um, because something that, that I really want to emphasize is that no one should pigeonhole you um, and make you uh, seem like you're only just good at one aspect of art direction. Um, as you will see later on, an art director has a lot of responsibilities. Um, so you have to be um, able to kind of adapt to different situations, um, be able to solve problems, like I just said, and effectively communicate with all parties. So, I put don't panic here because like I said, there's a lot of responsibilities for an art director. And this is kind of like very industry standard, right? So there are different types of art directors, um, but for an advertising specific one, so first you're, um, you often partner with a copywriter, right? And you guys work together as a team and oftentimes you'll consult strategy to come up with an idea for a campaign. So you'll be doing a lot of concepting work in the beginning. And then in the next phase, once you have a clear idea, it is your job to set the visual tone or a look and feel, which is the common industry term that gets thrown around a lot. And then from there, you're able to, um, you have to be, you know, able to like present your idea to your creative director in order to get their buy-in. And from there, once it's approved, you then have to present it to the client to sell it through. And let's say all things go well and you're able to sell your work and um, clients say, I love it, let's go make it. That's where the real fun begins. So now you're you know, stepping into production, right? So from that point on, you're going to oversee all visual aspects of your campaign. So whether that's design, um, maybe sometimes you'll be doing it yourself or you'll be working with a designer and um, you could be doing anything from print production where you know maybe you're making huge out-of-home billboards or it could be a photo shoot you know maybe with a celebrity um, it could be a video shoot maybe you're filming a spot um, somewhere in Mexico <laughs> for your idea and all of these things um, also encompass um, a lot of production related um, elements such as props like you have to be able to select props um, for shoots and things like that including wardrobe what is the talent going to wear um, in your video for instance you have to approve lighting storyboards so like i said all visual aspects of the campaign have to go through you you have to approve it and aside from that your job is to basically work with different parties or different departments that are involved um, in this campaign. So for instance, you'll be working with account to manage the project and timeline. Um, you'll also be working closely with production, uh, so your producer, to select the appropriate production company or partner that's going to bring your idea to life. And I think you guys already had a class in production, so you're familiar with how that process works. And once you are in production and post-production, you have to, again, oversee all aspects of it to make sure the work gets truly you know, elevated to the level that you're looking for. So you have to um, be heavily involved in the edit process, color, if you're you know, working with video or film, um, adding any kind of visual or sound effects or motion and things like that um, to eventually launch the campaign. So I know that, that was a lot, but you know, an art director um, 
like I said, needs to be a jack of all trades and be able to handle these things. Um, but today, I really want to just sort of focus on one thing that truly sets you apart as an art director. This is something that like no one else can do. And this is where you really get to shine, which is setting the visual tone or look and feel for your idea. And the assignment I'm going to give you guys um, after we wrap up um, is basically on how to develop an aesthetic uh, for a campaign or for a script. So once I provide a simple script, um, you'll get to create a mood board to establish this look and feel that I'm talking about. And what I mean by a mood board um, is that it's basically a collage of images that you pull from all kinds of places on the internet. You don't have to worry about where it comes from. And this collection of images are going to basically help visualize how you see the script or the idea coming to life. And this is incredibly important because you know how people say um, pictures are worth, you know, a picture is worth a uh, thousand words. And that's true. You know, oftentimes you don't even have to speak the same language. You can show a mood board and instantly it's able to connect with your audience because they get to feel something and they know by just looking at these images what you're trying to convey. But first, you have to consider the following. And you don't have to necessarily go in this order. Um, but one of them is really think about like, what's the tone of your idea or your script or the thing that you're trying to make? Is the idea playful and provocative like this Viva La Volva work? Um, for those of you who are not familiar with this, you can watch this video later. Um, but it was done for a brand, a feminine hygiene brand. And they created this delightful music video that basically celebrated um, uh, uh, women's body parts. And they were trying to kind of remove the stigma around periods. And um, it's, it's wonderful. You guys should absolutely watch it because they're able to pull so many amazing visual metaphors for a woman's vagina. And it's done really well. Um, or is the tone, you know, something more, a little more quirky and curious, like this Wes Anderson's uh, Moonrise Kingdom film. You know, you will hear people referencing Wes Anderson a lot because he's got such a unique style. Um, but these are some of the things that you want to consider. How do you want the audience to feel when you, when they see the idea and the mood board? And the next thing that you want to consider is what's the context, right? So when and where do you see this idea taking place? Who or what is featured? You have to kind of, you know, walk your mind through all of these um, questions because that's going to help inform the, 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 the choice of visuals uh, that you make. Is it a virtual library in Minecraft? For instance, there was this amazing campaign called the Uncensored Library. Um, it was for uh, Reporters Without Borders. As you know, certain countries do censor um, certain types of information. So they created this amazing library in Minecraft so that anybody from all over the world can access it. So then your visuals are obviously going to look a little more digitized, pixelated, right? Or is, he, is the script about maybe a couple living in an old haunted house in the 60s? then that visual is going to be drastically different from this Minecraft world, right? And speaking of a haunted house, um, so this was a couple of years ago. Um, I got to work on a really fun project where we did this sort of live experiential um, project at the, uh, at the largest, most haunted house in America. And um, it was super fun pretty nuts and scary. But um, as I was kind of developing the look and feel for this project, I found myself very drawn to American Horror Story. I don't know if you, you know, maybe some of you um, have seen it and, and I'm a huge fan. Um, and the thing that drew me to their posters was that like, they're not putting like, you know, crazy scary monsters and ghosts and things like that, right? But when you look at these at a quick glance, Something feels off. 
there's something unsettling about these images. Can't quite pinpoint what it is. And it draws you in through the use of texture, color, um, the way the type works. And so when you start to kind of look closely at the image, I'm looking at the one on the left, for instance, then I get, I start to see these like weird things, right? Like her eyes are scratched out. It feels like such a violent act and that conveys an emotion. And that starts to give me some goosebumps. She's holding a voodoo doll. And oh, oh, there's a snake coming out of her dress. <laughs> you know, it's kind of weird, right? And then let's go to this image, a um, second uh, from the right in the bottom row. It's like, oh, it kind of looks like a, maybe a family portrait, like, you know, kind of old school style. And then I look at it even closer and there, and there are like these two kids sitting way up there. It's like, how did they get up there? Wait, there's a guy burning. He's on fire in the back. Wait, there's a, a maid. She's trying to get blood out of the carpet. Wait, and there's a random ass dude <laughs> just, you know, basically hanging from the ceiling. What is happening here? Um, so anyways, these, all of these elements were really effective uh, for me personally because it just started giving me goosebumps and I'd start to get really scared by just looking at them. And that's the purpose of this mood board, right? So then I took some of those learnings and as I was kind of walking through this haunted house, my photographer and I were kind of looking for some of these moments. And I said to him like, hey, like there are these like retro looking wallpapers that are just kind of ripped from the walls. And that to me just feels very like strange, um, provocative. Can we get some of those pictures? And then when we walked into one of the many rooms in the house, there was like a, a, a sort of like a hanging, um, like a clothing line. And there was like a, a, what looked like a nightgown just kind of like hanging there. And this gust of wind suddenly blew right past it. I don't even know if the window was open. And the, the nightgown started kind of, you know, swaying. And that was like a very scary moment. And I said, take a picture of that thing right now, grab it. <laughs> and then from there, we were able to kind of, you know, digitally manipulate these photos. And then even like for the chandelier one, for instance, it's like, what if we turned off all the light bulbs except for one? Is that going to do something? And these weren't final images that, you know, that we ended up using in the campaign. I think we ended up kind of um, doing more work and then in, in publishing them as posters. But the, I wanted to show these to you guys because it's, it's all part of the process, right? You want to experiment a lot. You want to look at a lot of inspiration um, and then and try it and just, you know, try to translate what you're seeing and what you're inspired by into uh, something that you can really own. And another thing that you guys want to keep in mind is considering your audience. Who are you trying to engage with your idea? Is it kids that love ice cream or adults that need a lot of ice cream? <laughs> and um, if you haven't, check out uh, uh, this work by Halo Top um, by 72 and Sunny. They're very simple spots, but so funny. Comedy is just like spot on. So Halo Top is ice cream. Um, that's got, I think, low sugar and, and um, it's got low calories. So it's ice cream for adults. And in these spots, there's always an ice cream truck in a suburban sort of setting. And these kids all run to the ice cream truck saying like, yay, ice cream, ice cream. But the dude who works there is always sort of like pointing out at these adults that are nearby who are clearly miserable, whether they hate the job that they have or they can't get a date or whatever it is. And he's like, ah, oh, I think that person needs it more than you. And then he hands the ice cream to these adults. And it was just such a, um, like a kind of like quirky, but engaging way to sell your a product. And they've done it in a way so that like, even if you're a kid watching, I mean, who doesn't want ice cream, right? Um, it's very appealing to both sides. And I thought that was kind of interesting because 
sometimes you don't necessarily have to choose one or the other. There is a way to kind of, you know, aim at both. And so all of these things that I just talked about um, are going to help you guys sort of determine the overall art direction. Um, so from color, style, to typography, to like I said before, props, location, and even edit style, so that you start to sort of make sense of it all. And speaking of style, I wanna show you guys two spots um, that are both, um, that are you know, from journalism or news outlets. So the one on the left is, um, from the New York Times, and the one on the right is from The Guardian. Hey, Joe, am I able to play these videos? I was just wondering that. Let's, uh, yeah. let's see. All right, let's just uh, check. Oh. oh, okay. I think it's going to work. Let me just use my volume. You know what? I'm gonna exit full screen and try it again. Jean King serving. And then this one is a little bit longer. It's about two minutes. This isn't right. The three little pigs are the victims. Oh, down two houses. Oh, got what houses being blown down inside so job there's no reason why those two houses one made from straw the other from wood should have collapsed not even a healthy wolf stuff and puff could bring them down have confessed to conspiring to commit insurance fraud framing the wolf in an attempt to cover their traps their motive was financial as they struggle to keep up with their mortgage repayments. I'm behind on my payments too. What has it happened? I've lost everything. So, two different spots from journalism and news outlets, and they're very different, right? They couldn't be further apart um, in terms of style. So the one from the New York Times, it's very much editorial. It's simple, just with type, they're making a point. That there is gender inequality in sports, and they're kind of presenting it to you as a fact, right? And they don't show you very much, but with sound words, and then at the end, some editorial images, they're able to get the idea across. And to me, it's just as powerful as the other spot that was much of a bigger production, right? It's much more cinematic. It's, um, it takes place in this sort of semi-fantastical, um, you know, world, and, but that does a, a different, 
thing, right? It's giving you this sort of message that there, the Guardian is all about giving you the whole picture. 360 degree journalism, so you get to hear different opinions and really look at something from all angles. So there are two different viewpoints and the way they brought this to life is very different and that sort of goes to show that there is no right or wrong way of doing something um, or creating a mood board. As long as it conveys your message and makes, you, makes the audience feel something, you've done your part. So kind of keep this in mind as you guys are, you know, working through the process. Sorry, let me just go back to a uh, full screen. And so a lot of art directors will say building a mood board is basically like building a foundation for your idea. You lay the foundation and you invite your teammates, your clients, production companies to look at it and say, ah, I see what you're saying. I see what you're visualizing. Yes, let's go. So it's a very important step. Now I'm going to show you a few mood boards and I want you guys to kind of, you know, participate and then tell me um, certain emotions that you're feeling or certain keywords that pop up in your head. So when you look at this, what do you think it's about? You guys can either type stuff in chat or uh, if you want to share a perspective, would love for people to raise hands. Maria, are you able to see the chat? People are saying uh, like girl power, gender equality, empowerment, feminism, intersectional identity, feminism, feminism. Yep, yep. I mean, it's pretty, pretty obvious, right? Um, but what it, let's say you're just looking at one of these images. For instance, um, the one in the middle with like colorful silhouettes kind of drawn around this woman. If you were to just look at that, you're not going to get feminism or gender equality or any of these things that you guys just mentioned, right? And that's the power of a mood board. You're able to quickly pull these uh, swipes or visual references. And then as a collection, it gets your idea across. So then, you know, you look at that, but then you look at the poster next to it with the hands, uh, fists in the air then it starts to get closer and closer, right? And then you kind of expand and then look at the rest of them and you go, ah, I see what you mean. Here's another one. And that one was very sort of loose and kind of chaotic. This one's, you know, messy to a certain degree, but it feels a little bit more controlled, right? As a mood board, because there's a sort of like this common color scheme happening. What do you guys think this is about? And he says acid trip. <laughs> That's a pretty good one, actually. Right. Magnesium. Okay. Who is, uh, is this? Oh, this is Grace Kim. Grace Kim, you gotta, you gotta mute. I just muted your, you for you. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, dating, creativity, letting loose, going crazy. Sorry, that's just, that's from Grace. That's fine. No problem, Grace. <laughs> um, yeah. So this was a, a mood board that um, one of my art directors put together um, for Pandora. So it was all about how music makes you feel something, and it was actually about a mood board about moods. <laughs> Um, but you can kind of start to see certain people like to sort of, you know, start to manipulate these images to create a tighter mood board. And I wanted to kind of show you the, the difference between this one and the last one you saw. Here's another one. Now this one's very much more sort of, you know, cinematic, right? Big budget production. Um, and, you know, there's a sense that um, something is wrong, like the world is ending. Um, you know, we're seeing planet Earth with like ship flying uh, in space. There's a guy wearing sort of like a ventilator mask, cars are, you know, 
flying in the sky. Um, there's a lot going on here. Um, yeah, we're getting a lot of uh, apocalypse, dystopia. Exactly. Well, post post COVID. Nice, nice, Alex. Yep, yep, exactly. And there's even like a reference image from what looks like a Black Mirror episode, right? Yeah. So when you're looking for these, um, you know, inspirational images, you can really go like everywhere. You can go to film. You can go to a designer's website. Um, you can just do Google image search if that's your thing. Um, Pinterest, Instagram, there is no limit because what you're trying to do is just quickly pull as many as you can so that you can hand select the best ones um, that will communicate your idea in the most effective way. Maria, would you say that all of the examples you showed are equally effective or were there some, was there one that you felt like was, was kind of the, the star? I think they're all equally just as effective. Um, they're just very different styles, right? And I just wanted to show you guys sort of like the range um, so that, you know, if you're thinking about the script as in, so, you know, as being filmed in a very um, sort of uh, big cinematic way, then this would be the type of mood board that you put together. You would be, you know, you're more likely to go to, you know, Netflix or um, a director's reel to a screenshot some of these images. But if it's something like this, where it's more like illustration driven or graphic treatment driven, then um, you might go to a place like Design Inspiration um, or Pinterest. Um, so you can kind of start to think about like, okay, what is the, the, the tone that I'm trying to establish? And then what are some of these resources um, or sites that will give me the best um, in return? This is a, normally I'd wait and ask you this at the end, but I think yeah. it's relevant just right now. How long should you spend making a mood board? Hmm. I think that you should spend as much time as you want. Um, I think it, it's literally like, it can be, you know, an hour for some people or literally like three days for others. Um, just keep going until you're happy. Cause you know, oftentimes I'll find myself like, I'll be like, okay, I have about like 20 images on the slide already, but are they really like exactly what I'm looking for? Um, so then I, you know, I don't feel very satisfied then I'll continue my search. Um, so there's really no right or wrong answer here. And then relatedly, is there a number of, is there a minimum or maximum number of pieces or like artworks that ought to be part of a mood board? Or is that again, kind of subject to the, the piece, the taste? Yeah, it's totally subject to, you know, I think the scope of the work, like the campaign, the idea, um, you know, you don't have to limit yourself to just one page of um, images. You can create three pages if that's what you're looking for. Um, let's say you're creating a two minute film versus a 30 second spot that will obviously require more, um, swipes. Um, and a lot of times, um, I've seen some creatives do this as well, where instead of reading the script, they just show full bleed images. So think of, you know, kind of taking each image that you see on this slide and then going full page and then they just read the script in the background and they click through. So that from the client's perspective, they're able to clearly visualize what you're saying while listening to the script, um, which is another effective way of selling work. So Don Draper. Very Don Draper. <laughs> All right. Any other questions before we move on? No, I think that's, that's most of the, the questions for now. I'm sure there's more at the end for you, but that, thank you, super helpful. Yeah, cool. Um, and uh, here are some more tips. Um, like I said, try as many things as possible. Um, it's all about experimenting. Um, just keep going until you're like, wait, I find that really interesting or inspiring. How can I take that and then like try to, you know, do something with it. And then you'll, as you're researching, you'll come across another inspiration that might be, you know, totally different from what you've been kind of trying for the past like two days or something, um, then you switch. 
And you just have to kind of, again, not limit yourself um, and enjoy the process, you know, like whether you're spending hours on it or, you know, trying to find something that's exactly what's in your head or comping, comping images so that, you know, it's a little bit more detailed. Just enjoy the process and um, don't be shy to ask your copywriter partner to help you. Um, and, you know, another thing that um, makes an art director a really successful creative um, is that, you know, for instance, like Nea and Edward, um, they're very much well-versed in a variety of tools beyond Photoshop and Illustrator. So even if you kind of like know the basics um, around, you know, how to use Premiere or After Effects, you know, or other, you know, uh, creative tools, it allows you to um, give better directions and feedback when you're working with, say, a motion graphic artist um, or a post-production company. Because you have some of this background knowledge already. Um, so you can kind of, you know, better explain what sort of technique it is that you're looking for. Um, and as an art director, you're not just, again, limited to creating visuals. You have to be really great at verbal and written communication skills. Um, again, it's not just, you know, uh, creating beautiful images and then saying like, oh, here it is. You know, you have to stand uh, up there in front of the room, be able to persuade them, present well. And again, when you're working with your teams, give clear feedback and direction. And, um, you know, don't be shy to, uh, again, approach your partner, a copywriter partner and say, hey, can I take a stab at writing some scripts? Um, if you have a good partner, they'll welcome that. <laughs> um, don't, you know, but that doesn't mean, you know, pretend you're better than them at copywriting. That's not the point, right? It's just like, it's all about collaboration. And sometimes um, when you're creating a mood board for a script, you might come across an idea that affects the writing. And you might, you know, say like, hey, what if we, instead of this scenario, we tried something like this? That could be really interesting. So the script has to be, you know, constantly evolving and growing. And the work is never done until the day you finish it and ship and it's out in the real world. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, when you guys get your assignment, um, when I give you the simple script, um, I really want to encourage you guys to not just stick to what's in there. Um, feel free to kind of, you know, write it in your own words or, you know, uh, interpret it a little bit differently. Um, I kept the script very simple for that reason so that you guys can, again, take it and make it your own. And in case, you know, um, if you need more resources in terms of where to put, pull these images, um, I love designers like Jessica Walsh, um, who has been just kind of, you know, leading the charge in the branding world uh, the past decade. Um, she's really, really interesting. She's got a very unique, bold, iconic, like colorful style. Um, Pablo Rochat is um, uh, someone that I also really, um, uh, I guess, just like, um, look up to um, because he's able to kind of take um, what's culturally popular and just like turn it on its head and just find ways to really entertain people in super unexpected ways. So I highly encourage you guys to check out his work as well. Um, because again, when you're looking for inspiration, um, it, it doesn't mean that you have to go to all these award show sites like, you know, the One Club or ABC and things like that. <laughs> um, check out other people's work and um, useful resources like Film Grab. You know they they have basically every screenshot of you know every film out there. You can look at a bunch of directors' reels. Um, I linked this to a Word doc um, where I listed out some of my favorite uh, film directors that are very visual in style. Um, and there are tons of production houses that you can get inspired by. Um, the Mill being one of them, you know, they've done so, um, so much work. And again, you know, there's a bunch of other sites that I'm sure you guys are familiar with, but um, just keep exploring. 
And um, on that note, I'll just end with this quote from Bruce Lee, uh, be like water. Um, this is probably one of the best advices you're going to get um, on how to be an, a, an, a successful art director. You have to be very fluid. You have to be able to adapt to different situations. You have to wear multiple hats, jack of all trades. Um, now, there are certain people that want to hone in and focus on one specific thing. Um, Pablo is actually a good example of it. He's, he was able to really own the style that he's established. Um, but in advertising, a lot of times, you know, the brief that you get today is going to be really different from the brief that you got, you know, a couple weeks uh, from a different client. So, you know, how do you adapt to situations like that? Um, yeah. So on that note, if you guys have any questions, I'll open it up to some Q&A session. Actually, I want to put one that came at the beginning of the chat. Um, I think it was uh, Demetrius, and he asked if all art directors begin as designers. So I think it might be helpful to explain the different ways that people become art directors and maybe the dichotomy or like kind of the difference between what designers do and what art directors do and how they work together. Yeah. That's a great question. Um, no, not all our directors first um, become designers. That's just the path that I happen to take. Um, I've seen, you know, some students, you know, just through, you know, going to ad school, that's our director, that's what they wanted to become. And that's sort of like the path that they took. I've seen some graffiti artists first start in sort of like the streetwear graffiti type of world and then eventually make their way into becoming an advertising art director. Um, sometimes uh, really skilled illustrators will also um, uh, follow that path as well. Um, and you know, I've seen like people who were first lawyers, you know, doing that for, I don't know, like 10 years and then, and then they eventually decided like this, I can't do this anymore. You know, go back to like portfolio school, for instance, um, and get into advertising. Um, or, you know, back in the old days, like um, an assistant to someone like, you know, Jeff could be or Rich Silverstein. Maybe that's how they kind of learned art direction and, and the craft of, of um, advertising from being an assistant to their, um, to these, you know, ad gods. <laughs> and that's how they got in. There are just so many different ways. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, you know, if you're able to kind of, again, have sort of like a, an eye for design, art direction, visual storytelling, and have a passion for technology, especially uh, in this day and age, that's important. And able to kind of embrace those three things. Um, yeah, I, I would say anybody can become an art director. You don't always need to have traditional sort of like formal training. That's super insightful. Um, will you uh, unshare so that we can? Yeah. And then guys, if you have questions, uh, please do feel free to, to raise your hands um, and I'll unmute you. I think we got another, oh, here we go. Kevin's always got a good question. Kevin, I'm trying to unmute you. There we go. Cool. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So you were talking about, or I posted in the comments about back facing mood boards versus front facing mood boards. Do you go in with a mood board or you do you go in with two or three mood boards or can you just kind of briefly discuss on if you're confident in the mood board, are you trying to persuade people to that point or are you scrapping it and putting another one in? Like how does that process work for you? Yeah, um, I mean, again, I think it's a constantly evolving process. Um, so for instance, I'll be, you know, I could feel very confident about showing just one page of um, images, so a single mood board. But then, you know, an hour before the client meeting, I might come across something that I find really, really interesting. And I go in there and then swap things out or decide that one page isn't enough. Um, the maybe the script is again you know for a longer sort of narrative so then I add another one and 
Um, so it really depends on the type of project that you're dealing with and, and also your, your audience as well. If the clients um, really need a lot of handholding in terms of visualizing your idea or, or the script, you might benefit from showing more than less. I think that makes sense. And so specifically when you, when you're taking a mood board into a client, like, do you, do you come in with backup options in case they react poorly to the first one? Or do you, do you kind of come in confident in your one and you're like, if you hate it, we'll go back. Yeah. It's the latter. I mean, there's, there's time to adjust feedback. I don't think um, you should feel sort of, you know, nervous about them not, not liking your idea. Um, just sound very enthusiastic and show them that you're passionate about this style that you're about to show. And if they don't like it, I mean, that's kind of their problem. And then you say, hey, let me go back to the drawing board, figure something out, and then I'll come back to you. Um, so you don't have, you know, just be confident and, and, and trust in, in what you um, envision this uh, coming to life. And um, I think that's the beauty of being an art director is that it's your vision. It's no one else's. Yeah. Uh, Katerina asks uh, kind of a follow-up question there. Would you use a similar mood board creation process for developing a brand identity versus developing the campaign? The process is exactly the same, I would say. Um, again, it's kind of being mindful of those three things that I mentioned. Um, and, you know, obviously for something like, say, um, a, a TV spot, you might be mixing some um, static images with some like motion stuff. Maybe there's, you know, type involved and it could be a variety of style um, or types of images. But if it's more focused on brand branding and identity, then, then you might be able to just uh, pull some color swatches, some typefaces. Um, so yeah, it really depends on what you're working on. But the, but the process, I would say, is the same. Makes sense. Um, what's something that would surprise people about your day-to-day? -day? My day-to-day? You would be very surprised. <laughs> I think as an ACD, there is very little time to actually do the work. And I love being hands-on. So um, I like to kind of help my team um, by actually doing the work and not just, you know, giving directions. But during the day, I'm just constantly in meetings, jumping from one Zoom call to another, that um, by the time I get to actually making something, it's already like eight o'clock. <laughs> um, so yeah, I know. I'm just trying to give you, get, paint the, the, the real picture here, is that uh, um, an art director has a lot of responsibilities. That I think that puts it mildly. <laughs> um, from the perspective of an art director, what makes an account manager good to work with? What makes one not so good to work with? I think a, an awesome account director um, really understands how long um, the creative process takes and they're able to be uh, understanding and really empathize <laughs> with uh, the art director and sort of like the burden that they have on their shoulders. Um, so they'll always come to you and say, hey, clients are asking for this or you know, we have to um, you know, address this comment when do you think that we should go back? And they'll always kind of open it up um, to you. And it's never like, hey, we need to send this in two hours and give you sort of like that ultimatum. I would imagine yeah. also going to bat for you in a client meeting, right? Where like you go exactly. head to head with a client and, and there's always that kind of like awkward, like, oh, who's gonna step in? And it's like the good account person, like comes in with a thoughtful argument and articulates some point, you know, and doesn't. That's actually a really good point. Yeah. I mean, a good account person um, is able to be a bulldog um, <laughs> with the clients and kind of bully them sometimes, you know, and like you said, give a very sort of, sort of solid rationale behind why the work um, is effective and why the team believes in it and be able to fight for your work. Um, 
the worst uh, kind of uh, account person to work with is somebody who just wants to, who's one-sided and just wants to please the clients all the time, right? That's not how it works. It's a, it's a relationship. Yeah, I think that ties super well to Maggie, who was our account uh, kind of lesson earlier, who was kind of talking about the, the kind of dual hats that good account people wear between like understanding the client's perspective and making sure that that's relayed articulately to the creative team, but also when the creative team is presenting, when you have to go to bat on behalf of the agency, that you're an aligned team, you're together, the creative team is with you. Exactly. Um, Alexa, I'm gonna unmute you here. Hi, thanks so much for the talk. My question is about when you're working with a partner, so I'm a copywriter, and when working on portfolio pieces and once the copywriter hands over the copy to the art director, how can the writer support the art director in that period? That's a really great question. Um, I think that uh, oftentimes um, copywriters kind of make the mistake of saying like, well, here it is. So, you know, you got to put some visuals to my words. And um, if you're able to kind of, you know, work with the partner in such a like a collaborative manner so you say hey this is my first stab at it but what do you think and invite them into your copywriting process that's like super ideal because um a lot of times this you know for instance the idea changes uh quite a bit as the art director is doing sort of this visual exercise and you can also offer to help just you know find images um it is a pretty long process. Um, sometimes, you know, when you write very specific things in your script, um, you, ha you can't really find it just by doing like a quick Google search, right? So yeah, I mean, and also I would say offering to, uh, to stay um, late <laughs> at the agency with your partner. Oh man, that shows, it's, it's such a, um, like it goes to show how much you care about them, which means a lot, <laughs> a lot of times. Great, thanks. There's um, in the chat before it gets lost, uh, what do you look for um, in an aspiring art director's portfolio? That's, uh, um, I would say, I think, I really value um, idea, but at the same time, I think an art director um, needs to be able to bring that idea to life in a, in a visually compelling manner. So the things that I look for are like, what's the idea and how did you visualize it? That, you know, obviously goes back to design and sort of visual storytelling, right? And um, an art director who is skilled um, in design, so like the very fundamental um, uh, skills of, of, you know, say like graphic design, for instance, because it involves like typography, like you guys learned with Han um, last week, they're very important. Um, and so I wouldn't, I would definitely spend some time kind of um, sharpening those skills and uh, make sure that there's a balance, that you're not just kind of like a concept heavy art director or more of a design um, heavy art director. Try to find a balance. There's, uh, there are two questions here that I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of combine into one. Uh, so one being, how do you work with comms planners? And another being, uh, how do you work with strategists to create the brief? Do you connect much with them? If so, like how do you kind of interact with, with strategists generally? Yeah. Um, I think one of my favorite uh, steps in this sort of like creative process is actually sitting down with the strategy team and writing a brief. Um, it's really exciting because again, I think it goes back to sort of like the designer in me where design is all about problem solving and a brief starts with a problem, right? And you kind of, you know, chat with your, with your strategy, strategy team around like, what is the insight? Like what's the audience insight? What's the cultural insight? You have to pay attention to what's happening in the world. Um, and, um, you know, kind of ask them like, 
what is sort of like the, um, where does the brand stand on this issue? And you, cause you have to take that into consideration too. Um, so there's a lot of different elements, but, um, and then with the, with the Comstrat team, so that, if that's more uh, with the brand strat, with the Comstrat team, then you have to sort of help them plan um, almost like a, a roadmap, right? So from the moment the, the campaign launches, what, what are the channels that you want your creative to live in? Um, and that's super important because again, depending on who you're talking to, who your audience is, if you're talking to Gen Z, maybe you know, doing something on TikTok makes sense. Um, or if you're talking to sort of like older millennials, um, maybe Facebook is a platform that they're more you know, active on. Um, so you wanna make these sort of um, choices um, and, you know, you know, invite, again, invite the teammates um, to help you uh, make these informed decisions. It's not just on you. It's, it should always be like, what do you think is best for the creative? As an old out of touch millennial, I take offense to the Facebook note, but uh, <laughs> what is, uh, what's one thing you wish somebody would have told you before you started uh, in your current role? And I think that means more art direction than like specifically a good B. You don't have to shit talk right. good B. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wish someone had told me to um, to be louder, like early on in my career. Um, when I first started my career, advertising was. I mean, it's it still has a. I mean, it's improved a lot over the years, but back in the day, it was very, um, there was no, you know, gender balance um, in terms of like the, you know, male to female ratio um, at basically the majority of agencies. Um, and it had a very uh, toxic sort of culture. And me sort of being this, you know, kind of introverted person, um, I thought that if I just kind of keep my head down, you know, work hard and just do my job and, and, and stay out of drama, then that's enough to kind of propel my career. That's not the case. Um, you have to stand your ground, fight for your work. You have to be loud. You have to kind of, you know, be aggressive and be assertive when it comes to, you know, whether it's like getting on, you know, good briefs or you know getting the opportunity to present to clients like fight for that kind of stuff I, and I hate that yet I have to use the word fight for it um, but at the same time no one's gonna hand it to you um, so yeah you gotta gotta be loud stay loud that's great advice and I think it's especially funny because most of our questions are coming in chat right now so guys come on raise your hand get loud um, I, I'm selfishly curious if you have any ghost stories because you talked about that a lot in your talk. Uh, oh my gosh. Um, Neha, do not bring me into this. <laughs> Maybe this is a perfect no, time. No, Neha's <laughs> into it. Neha says she can see spirits. Okay, Neha, you want to yeah, share that at, with the class? We, me, Maria, and our team were like on a, on a team's chat at like midnight for an hour just talking about ghosts. That's just the context. <laughs> We'll upload that uh, after the class. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I personally have not seen any ghosts, um, but it seems like I'm surrounded by people who are able to see ghosts, like Naya, for instance. Um, my brother and my mom saw a figure that apparently 30 years before they did, my grandma saw the same ghost in a different place, um, which is kind of crazy. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm very fascinated with this whole like paranormal investigation or activity kind of type of shows that are on TV. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I've never personally experienced any of it. So it's always just a, a just a simple curiosity kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, same. I've never seen any ghosts. Um, okay, I think this is probably Last question, then we can wrap up. Um, best pieces of advice that you've received, other than be like water. <laughs> be like water. Um, 
Yeah, and, and other than stay loud, I think um, the best piece of advice that I received was uh, be a selfish creative. And I think that says a lot. Um, I think it kind of goes back to everything that I just said, which is like, you've got to advocate for yourself. You got to fight for your work and you got to sort of stay loud um, to make sure that your idea um, sees light. And um, if you're, if you care a lot about your work and you're able to sort of act in a selfish manner, it's going to be mutually be you know, beneficial. So it benefits the agency, it benefits the clients, it makes you, um, uh, you know, really valued um, as a creative and, you know, everyone kind of um, is able to put their best foot forward. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I think that's, that's super strong advice. And it, it, especially, you know, like going from either being a student or being in one discipline and moving to another, uh, joining, you know, a new team and a new industry can feel super intimidating, but they're paying you because they've found your perspective to be worth paying for. So I think it is important that, you know, you, you put your perspective out into the world um, with force. And I think the, the flip side of that is when a decision doesn't go your way, that you remain part of the team and you, you find ways to make it work. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Go ahead. I thought, you had a, I thought you had a follow up. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, you have to know, you know, when to stop pushing, right? So use your best judgment. Um, you don't want to come across as like an, an asshole creative. That's not what I mean. Uh, being selfish also means, you know, um, being, being kind to others and being a collaborative team player. Totally. Um, there's one more straggler here, kind of related to the strategist question, but are, are, are there qualities in strategists that you particularly like? Um, what, are the, what are the best strategists you've worked with like? What kind of stuff do they provide to you to help? Sure. Um, I think some of my favorite strategists uh, come up with a ton of thought starters. I love thought starters. Um, some amazing campaigns have been born out of like a single line of strategy. You're not you when you're hungry by Snickers. Beautiful line. And, and it just kind of wrote itself, right? Like, I mean, that's, that's the work. And um, a, a, a creative strategist is able to bring the team lots of thought starters so that you can tackle this, the problem from all different angles. Um, and I think you should kind of strive to, to do that. It's not just like, here's a problem and, and here's a, an insight, um, you know, let's figure it out. And like, you know, a few um, sort of like inspiration or whatever, um, spend a lot of time doing research. Um, I think even in this, go in the same goes for the creatives as well. Like do a lot of research on your, on, on your own um, whether that's on the audience or the brand or the product or just like a cultural insight, it's going to make your work stronger. Yeah. I, I think you've alluded to this just in the way that you talked about working with strategists. And we've heard this from a couple of the other folks who we've, we've heard kind of teach lessons so far, but I think there is a sense that there is a traditional strategy process, which is like, write the brief done, hand it off and then don't talk to the creative team anymore. And I think, consensus is on both sides that does not work well. Um, so finding ways to continue to add value and to like talk to those creative teams throughout the process. Like Maria is sitting here telling you it is valuable. It is valuable. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Even after the client like approves the strategy, you guys might come across something that just, I don't know, completely contradicts what you already presented. And then and don't be, don't be afraid to go back to the clients and say like, hey, actually, we like this better. Prove your case and, and they'll love you for it. Um, just being very honest is, is key too. Totally. Well, that was super enlightening. Um, thank you so much for sharing all that insight. I thought that was, that was it, like, shed such a great kind of perspective on the difference between how designers work and how art directors think. Um, 
normally there would be an outpouring in the group chat right now. I'm sure people are just get, like absorbing all of your knowledge. Uh, thank you so much for, for joining us this week. Um, here, there, 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 now it's starting. Uh, getting the cascade. Um, the assignment, uh, do you want to, do you want to just like run through the assignment real quick and then we'll, we'll make sure that as usual we get, we post that within the subreddit. Um, but just wanted to kind of like make sure we, we state that out for the, the class here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm going to provide a very simple, uh, TV script and, um, you know, if you guys want to, uh, just kind of stick to what's on paper, like that's fine. Um, but your job is to create a mood board that again, does the three things that I told you about before and creates, um, or, you know, communicates how you see this coming to life. Um, so you, yeah, you can stick to uh, the script that I provide or you can tweak it if you want. That's totally fine too. Cool. Well, this has been awesome. Thank you so much for your time and uh, we'll see everybody in the subreddit. Sounds good. Thank you guys so much for having me. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye everybody. See ya.